Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News for this Wednesday, January 22. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. With the controversy surrounding the visit of U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to Jamaica, he is this afternoon insisting there is no intention to divide CARICOM. At least four countries, led by Barbados Prime Minister and CARICOM Chairman Mia Motley, are suspicious about the visit, arguing that not all countries were invited to meet with Mr. Pompeo. Only six countries and Jamaica will be participating in this afternoon's roundtable with the Secretary of State. Prime Minister Andrew Hulness responded to the issue at a press conference this morning. We all must respect the sovereignty of countries to determine how they structure their foreign policy. Uh, when friends ask to be hosted or for us to host them, we're friends. And so we do that. We're friends with the United States. So we are happy to host here, not to the exclusion of anyone. And if anyone wanted to attend, they just had to signal. Uh, from my perspective, we would have done everything to ensure that they are present. There's no intent from the United States to divide CARICOM. We know that countries in this region will agree with the United States on certain positions from time to time and disagree with us from time to time. That's true for Jamaica as well. It's true for many of the folks that I'll visit with this afternoon. Uh, we want to invite them all to be part of the economic prosperity security zone that is this region. Uh, we welcome the leadership that Jamaica has demonstrated in this region, in the CARICOM region. Meanwhile, Jamaica and the United States have agreed to strengthen cooperation in security. The main focus will be on bolstering Jamaica's capacity to counter transnational organized crime, secure our borders and ports, and interrupt the flow of illicit weapons into our country. Development and infrastructure were also on our list of topics today. Last year, Jamaica became the first Caribbean partner to join our growth in the Americas initiative. And we're honored to assist our Caribbean friends in making their countries more attractive to private sector infrastructure investment. Former Education Minister Ruel Reed and President of the Caribbean Maritime University, Professor Fritz Spinock, will return to the Supreme Court next month to have the fraud charges against them quashed. The full court is scheduled to hear the application on February 10. Lead attorney Hugh Wildman, who told, told our news center that the three-member panel of judges will hear the appeal. Chief Justice Brian Sachs rejected the application last month. Mr. Wildman says the law gives him the right to renew the application before the full court. And we return to another story talking about the CMU. Now, the media and politics are being blamed for the troubles now being faced by the CMU president. In a 10-minute, 43-second video posted on YouTube, Professor Pinnock's daughter Abigail defended her father and proclaimed his innocence. We have more from TVJ's Shane Masters. Let me tell you something. My father is not a thief. Dr. Abigail Pinnock, the daughter of CMU President Professor Fritz Pinnock, coming to the defense of her father in a live presentation on social media site YouTube on Tuesday night. Much focus has been placed on the CMU in recent days, with the findings of the Auditor General's report on the operations of his school being revealed by the media. The AG report pointed to poor governance practices at the CMU, procurement breaches totaling close to $218 million and close to $990,000 U.S. dollars. The HR policy was also breached as staff were engaged without advertisements or interviews. Dr. Pinnock, in the almost 11-minute presentation, defended her father, describing him as a humble man who was being made a scapegoat. This case that's out there about my father, I want to let the world know, right? It's politics. Let me tell you that. Politics. Fritz Pinnock is not the man that they're trying to make him out to look like. Let me tell you something. Taxpayers' money can't pay captains on the staff let me tell you captains get over 5,000 us per month or more okay 
half of the staff on there cannot be paid from taxpayers' money. So the, so the whole thing about stealing taxpayer money is crap. She says since Professor Pinnock took charge of the institution in 2006, the volume of work which has taken place at the institution could not be carried out with only taxpayers' money. Half of the times when Daddy goes on those trips, it's trying to get funding and people. He's saying he's a professional beggar and that is what he has become for that school. That school never have sent. Daddy not even ask for them to raise him pay. He's supposed to have raised pay. You see that published, what I'm publishing the Glean about his pay, that was a lie. Daddy get way less than that. And that's another thing. He was like, look at all of these false news that they're putting out. Daddy just sit down there, calm him, say, you know what? I'm not taking nobody money. I can't sleep good at night. Ms. Pinnock claims that the country on a whole is not repaying the CMU head for the work which he has done to bring a certain standard to the university. Whenever anybody try to progress, whenever somebody have a heart for the country, they just bring it on. It's politics, man. Y'all don't understand what's going on, man. Half of the things I can't even say on this thing. My father would be so upset if I came here. But y'all don't understand what's going on. Lord Jesus. I'm sorry, it is so emotional because the person that they're trying to make him out to be is the total opposite. We would have been living real good if he had taken half of the things from that school. Machine Masters, TVJ News. And it's time for a break. We have more stories right after these messages. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. The debate on amendments to the anti-gang law are to, is to continue today. Well, it's continued on Tuesday. The Joint Select Committee of Parliament is reviewing the recommendations of the Act. We have details in this report. Several recommendations in the report examined at Tuesday's Joint Select Committee meeting on the anti-gang legislation, but there was lengthy debate on one issue. The term serious offenses of a criminal organization, which would include smaller crimes such as simple arsony. It's recommended that the term be replaced with an applicable offence, but committee members had different views. What we have done then is we have now um, put offences into this legislation which we do not regard as serious offences to be dealt with as if they were. It seems that this would capture a gang of pickpockets, for example, which can't be, can't have been the intention. Of the, certainly, you know, as I think the minister who piloted the, the bill through parliament originally, that was not the, what we anticipated this would be addressing. Solicitor General Marlene Aldred noted that the Director of Public Prosecutions supported the recommendation. They have recognized that there are offenses that are that are money-making offenses for these gang members, that they are able to easily link with these gang members, and it has been coming up in a number of these new recent matters. You change with the gang, which are involved in primarily robbery. So the issue of simple larceny and primary, yeah, they would in hopes take out the television and of course, and then fence it on the market and it's a systematic operation. You do 20 television a month is good money. Or in the case of Clarendon where they would steal goats, which is just pre the last thing. But it was the gang activity to get goats, goat meat to Haiti to get firearms. Additionally, Attorney General Marlene Malahu Fort explained that while a lesser offense of larceny would return a smaller penalty on conviction, the inclusion in this act would prevent unforeseen issues. So, so, so the whole idea is to ensure that where evidence is clear that an offense has been committed, you do not end up with a, an acquittal for mere technicality because of how offenses are categorized. The matter was left for further debate. The committee will meet again on January 28 before submitting a final report to Parliament. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is touting the success which can be achieved from an increase in investments in Port Royal. His comments follow the first cruise call on Monday, which saw over 2,000 visitors to Port Royal. 
Speaking at the launch of the Jamaica Stock Exchange Conference last night, Mr. Holness says the country stands to benefit significantly from the opening of the new seaport. Four or five cruise ships coming in a week and people start to invest in Port Royal. The employment that it will create. But it won't be only Port Royal. Because on this trip, people went to Trenchtown, they went to Bob Marley Museum, some went up into the hills to see our coffee. But we have so many attractions. In the meantime, the Prime Minister says Monday's cruise port call was a test for the government to see what needs to be adjusted before the official opening in March. He says a number of issues have been identified and the requisite investments will be put in place before the port becomes fully operational. Meanwhile, given its history, there are concerns about the environmental threats at Port Royal, but the government says it will preserve the historic characteristics of the town. 1692, the town of Port Royal was hit by a large earthquake. The impact of that disaster is still evident today, with almost half of the community still buried under the sea. As a result, Prime Minister Andrew Holness says cruise ships docking at the town's port could have implications for artifacts buried in the sea. So we, put it, we, we brought in a technology called, uh, it's a floating seawalk. And so what happens is that the ship is moored off the coast and the seawalk extends to the ship, and that ship doesn't come anywhere close to the sunken city or any other sensitive environmental asset in the area. Mr. Holness explains that more infrastructure development is necessary to preserve the historic town, and that is why he argues the government will be taking a proactive approach. So in the investment in Port Royal, there will be works to build a seawall, there will be works to raise the various foundations of buildings that we are putting in. We will, within Port Royal, remove houses that are at risk and place them in safer places. So the truth is that the investment in Port Royal is not just going to create economic value, but it is going to ultimately protect the environment. Oshane Masters, TVJ News. The Western Regional Health Authority has reported a reduction in the region's ADES index. The regional vector control officer is crediting the success to the efforts of vector control workers. We have more in this report. According to vector control officer at the Western Regional Health Authority, Ryan Morris, thousands of premises have been inspected for mosquito breeding sites in the health region since July 1. He said so far there have been a steady reduction in the mosquito population. We saw our index coming down from 24.25 in June because we started at the 1st of July. We saw it coming down from June from 24.24 down to 6.5 at the end of December 2019. So that in itself is significant gain, over 17% reduction in the EADs index population. He added that St. James, West Milan and Trelawney were in the 20s, while Hanover was in the lower teens, but cumulatively that would have brought the population to little over 24 percent. While he credits the reduction to the increase in vector control workers and partnerships with government entities, he says citizens' lack of personal responsibility is a challenge. We can't do it by ourselves. We need everyone on deck. As I mentioned before, a small number of EADs mosquito can cause a large outbreak. We are out there doing our health education, doing our bliss activity in, in town centers, trying to educate persons, trying to change behavior. Yes, we are, we, 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 are, we are seeing positive strides, but there are still some persons who don't seem to be connecting the dots. In the meantime, he's imploring citizens in western Jamaica to take part in the National Dengue Cleanup Drive scheduled for January 24 to 26. So we'll focus on different aspects of the community on different days. 24th, the aim is to focus on schools and business. On the 25th, 
we want to go town centers, community for bulk waste collection. And on the 26th now, where we would have more persons at home the Sunday, we want to focus on the householder, where they, where they, they can go around their premises, take out what needs to be taken out. And despite the extension of the ministry's enhanced vector control to April 10, Mr. Morris said the Western Regional Health Authority will continue to step up its vector control strategies in the fight against dengue. Prince Moore, TVJ News. And in sports, the Sunshine Girls started their 2020 season on a high and will be looking to maintain their winning streak when they face World Champions New Zealand in the Vitality Nations Cup today in Birmingham. Sunshine Girls' tough task master Connie Francis got her dream start on Sunday when the team defeated South Africa 59-54 in their opening game. But despite winning on Sunday, Francis made note of some inconsistencies throughout the quarters, and she's hoping the team will show improvement in these areas. We need a better concentration. Um, I think we made some unforced errors that can be cleaned up, and um, just to, to go at them, because um, I think that we stand a chance. We know that we're not as fit as them, um, but... If we play our cards right, we have been working really well together. We have been, all the combination that we have tried, it seems to be coming through. There is also one department that Francis will be giving some extra attention. If we can get our balls in, our shooters are shooting really well. But it's just our through code play. Although it's just really one and two times we lapse, I think um, it is costly. And against the world champion, it will be very costly for us. Meanwhile, top defender Shamira Sterling suffered an injury to her ankle in Sunday's game, which forced her to immediately leave the court. But not to worry, says Francis. Um, she got us scared with the ankle. She rolled it slightly, but her threshold for pain is very, very high. So, <laughs> But she's fine, you know. Our physio has been working on the foot. Um, she'll be ready for it tomorrow. New Zealand's Silver Ferns were also winners in their first game, beating England 64-48. The game will get underway at 12.30 p.m. Jamaica time. Trishana McGowan, TVJ Sports. Trishana McGowan. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.